Mr. Stuart Smith, who is going to start our talk now. Hello, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Stuart, I work for IBM, uh, out of Melbourne, but mostly with people in Canberra and the rest of the world. It turns out with a company like IBM, you have many offices everywhere. Um, but uh, I'm the lone Melbourne representative, representative in our awesome team. Uh, I think I technically have the title of Opal Architect, uh, or some such thing, uh, but I'm primarily focused on open power firmware, uh, which relates to Linux kernel and other such fun things as well, and occasionally delving into the strange, luxurious world of user space. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, adventures in open power firmware, and we're going to start at uh, the wonderful idea of having a computer. So this is a computer, if you haven't seen one before. Uh, this is an IBM one. Uh, it has the fancy uh, name of S8, S812LC, um, so everyone can Google that and go and buy one. Uh, this one's a single socket open power Power8 box. Uh, so let's go for a bit of an adventure and start as if this machine is off. Uh, if you look inside the machine, uh, and if you were looking at a, a dual socket one, it would look a little bit like this, sort of architecturally. There's PCI and stuff hangs off it, and then you've got chips talk to each other, and then they go out and talk to memory. Uh, the interesting thing about P8 chips is there are sort of level four cache on a memory controller that's external to the processor, and we'll turn up, talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so this is the Centaur memory buffer chip. Uh, it's where sort of DDR3 protocols are handled and other such fun things. Uh, so what happens when we turn on the power? And in case you are not aware of the fact that that's a wonderful pun, uh, I would like to call your attention to it because I think I have at least two of them that I thought very hard about for a long time. So when you turn a computer on, you expect things to just kind of work, right? I mean, you know, the processor instantly starts executing things and you boot something fairly quickly and you go, wow, what the hell's going on? I really should have bought an SSD rather than the slow disk. Everyone has that experience? It's like, just like when you're Apple II, you flicked it on and went duck, 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 and everyone under 30 in the room is going, what? <sighs> okay, so it turns out uh, this isn't true at all. For a start, you need a computer to turn on your computer. So you have some other computer inside your computer that is going to help you turn on your computer. In a laptop, it's probably a little microcontroller that just pulls the little button going on there. If it's on a desktop, it may also just be a little microcontroller that looks for power on LAN signals and the power button at the front. Uh, or if it's a server class computer, you probably have something called a BMC. Um, I think the B stands for base, not bloody. Um, but uh, uh, it has, some of them have one that may be an ARM chip, some of them may be a PowerPC chip, some of them may be x86, x86 even. Oh, x86 BMC to boot your x86 server? Oh, yeah, no. We, well, <laughs> on the IBM uh, big boxes, there's a, a PowerPC one, uh, and on the LC ones, it is ARM. Uh, c of course, these things run Linux. So you have a Linux computer to boot your Linux computer. And at some point, we have some kind of inception thing going on. Uh, the current reference design for open power machines is a AST 2400 little ARM system on a chip. Uh, these little computers do things like talk IPMI over a network, give you a nice web UI, or give you a bad web UI, depending on which vendor you go with. Uh, and they twiddle things on, like turn the computer on and tell you that you know, the fans are running or they're not running and all that kind of jazz. Uh, so the BMC boots first. So when you plug it in and you start turning on your computer, you go, well, I've started a little computer inside my computer that's now booted up uh, through a Linux kernel. You're now in this standby state where your big computer isn't on, but your little computer's on. Now, there's probably another little computer inside the BMC to turn that on, or? <laughs> Pardon? It's always on. <laughs> but uh, after the BMC is booted, uh, we need to tell it to go. So you press the power button. Yep, more puns the better. Uh, so this could be a physical power button that's uh, on the front of the machine. It could be a virtual one that you do over IPMI, over a network. It could be a form on a, on a web page. And then things start happening. So let's look what happens. So this is uh, what happens on one of these things. Uh, this is an AMI bus running on an open power machine. It says, please wait, as it twiddles things and goes.
on. <laughs> so what actually happens here? Uh, if we were connected to the serial over LAN console, so using IPMI to connect serial over LAN, uh, we would see something along the following. Uh, so here at the same time, we're connected via IPMI, and we get the serial over LAN console, and uh, this little thing here is me then going to the other window to hit the power on button, uh, and things start whirring. So things here will have to happen, like you know, fans have to spin up, because apparently you want to cool your processors. And then we have these things happening here, which is called as iStep, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. This says uh, hardware was present. Uh, you apparently need some memory, one of those memory controller things in a processor, otherwise you're not going to boot very far. Um, so it turns out you should detect those during boot. Goes to a whole bunch of other system initialization steps uh, going on here. Uh, one step here that takes a little while is uh, zeroing memory. So if you have ECC memory, it turns out that uh, memory DRAM comes up with bits in all sorts of uh, conditions, and you want to zero that so you actually get valid ECC bits on zero. Uh, the last little thing here that says uh, OCCs are now running in active state. That means we've started thermal control, and we can run the processor at faster speeds. Uh, we now load uh, our second bit of firmware, which is known as Ski Boot, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and this does things like set up PCI, uh, get a device tree in a nice uh, set of state for Linux, say, oh, look, these memory regions are reserved for these runtime facilities. And then out of ROM, it loads a Linux kernel, uh, which does things like be able to access disks through said PCI slots, read file systems, uh, deal with RAID, uh, what else have we got going on here? Talk to network adapters if you wanted to net boot, uh, detect what disks you have in the system, uh, what partition table layouts they have, and then it comes up with this petty boot uh, user interface. And this is the bootloader. Uh, this lets you see here we have a machine installed Ubuntu, a few different kernels on that. We have Cyril's context switch experimental kernel on a net boot we could boot. Um, <laughs> and we can just exit out of it, and we get a busy box shell. So in firmware, we have something that is uh, four patches ahead of 4.2.6 uh, that you could exit out into busy box shell and fix your very broken computer so it would boot again, uh, which is a whole bunch of fun. So at this point, we're now at the stage where we can boot an OS and do something you want to do with your computer, which is probably not just run firmware, unless you're me. So. If we select an OS to boot in this, uh, what happens? Well, we use kexec, because we've already got a Linux kernel there, and kexec tends to work, and there's some bugs to fix sometimes, but that happens. Uh, but let's go back to firmware, because once we're running an operating system that you want to run, that's considered boring, because that tends to just work, and there's no problems ever. Um, so let's go back to firmware, because that's a lot more exciting and fraught with fun. So what are these I-steps we saw that happened there? Uh, so before we have a machine that's even usable to select what we want to boot, what happens? So this I-steps comes from this acronym because uh, we're IBM and therefore we need a three-letter acronym for everything. Uh, does anyone not need a three-letter acronym? You sometimes need a two-letter acronym? Yes. So this probably has some insane long history going back to well before everyone was ever born, uh, but it's called initial program load, and that's basically load the initial piece of code onto the computer to run and get to that stage. Luckily, there's a handy, simple diagram to explain what happens during this process. Um, and so this is up on, on GitHub in the documentation here, and the first step of it is uh, running on a little thing inside the PA chip called the self-boot engine. So this is a tiny little sort of embedded microcontroller sitting off the side, uh, and that exists in hardware there because the aim is to have the CPU itself start itself up, uh, rather than having an external processor like a service processor or the BMC be heavily involved in setting up the processor. Uh, so it does a whole bunch of very early uh, initialization state. Uh, but the BMC first twiddles it, so it starts to put some power to the chip and goes, here's the magic set of sequence that I uh, twiddle to, uh, to have the self-boot engine start. Uh, it then goes through a process of running through several different ROMs and very little amounts of code in there to init one core. Because, of course, this is a large you know, 8, 10, 12 core chip. Uh, but to get it up to the stage of running all those cores and having them talk to each other, we are going to try and get one core running. Uh, so we get to the end of all this, uh, we start, you know, some clocks going inside the machine, we init one core with one set of L2 and L3 cache, which is called an EX unit, uh, and we get something uh, 
uh, going that will have one core executing code out of L3 cache, which is the self-boot self engine host boot load. So we get to the point of we can load some code into L3 cache and start executing it. And we have something that is recognizable as a power uh, core. This uh, host boot, uh, we have it in a couple of parts. It's called host boot base image, and this is the small part of it to try and get from a stage of having one core executing code out of L3 to get to a stage where you could have maybe multiple cores and memory, because it turns out that not everyone just wants to write programs that fit inside L3 cache. Even though there's a lot of it, like you look at how big L3 cache is on these boxes, it's actually a lot. It's like it took a long time before I had a computer with that much RAM. But it turns out that's L3 cache now. And so host boot itself is around 400,000 lines of C++. And C++ is an engineering design choice. <laughs> um, having uh, been involved in large C++ projects before, I can, I can make that statement. Um, and host boot is not something that is ever user visible, right? This, if you are using a power box, you will not care about it at all. It's the bit that boots your computer and then goes away. Uh, it actually implements itself a microkernel, uh, so it has its own user space uh, and a VFS, of all things. Um, and it's really unlike other boot firmware for one important reason. You can pull the code from GitHub. So you can go and compile and look what's going on. So you can get the code for what happens to get the rest of your CPU happening. And what it does next is starts to init the processor buses, because it turns out there are buses going between where the cores are, and it's good to talk to other things rather than just yourself. Uh, and then it starts going through the process to initialize memory, because at some point, you're going to need more memory than it is available in one L3 cache block on one core for fancy reasons. Apparently, 64-bit addressing is a new fad because more memory than 12 megabytes is a good thing. Um, but we can do it. So firmware can also start using memory once we bring memory online, because currently it has to be very constrained in the small bit. Uh, we skip over a lot of details here. There is a longer page document that goes on for like 100 pages, which is the description of each of these steps. Uh, so if you're feeling particularly like wanting to know exactly what uh, DRAM training is uh, in the exact IPL step after you've set the voltage correctly, go and read that. But you can also read it all there. There's a bootflow PDF, there's some other documentation there, there's this diagram, uh, and of course there's the source code itself, which is the ultimate documentation of what's actually happening. So we then start to initialize cores. Uh, well, first we actually modify what's called the sleep winkle image. So there's a little uh, bit of hardware in there that is to do with power management. So at runtime, you want to be able to power off a core, because it turns out cores use power. And if you're not using them all the time, you may as well turn them off to save some of it. And so we have a little thing in there that can turn a core on and off. So host boot sets up this to be able to bring a core online, and it boots it up, and then sets up that image so that at runtime, we can have Linux able to use that same unit to bring cores on and offline. So we get to the point of where we can bring a co other cores online and set things up so that at runtime we can do some, some power saving. Uh, also through this entire process, uh, we will check that the hardware still works as we would expect it to. So if you have a uh, memory module that isn't functioning correct correctly, it can just disable it and boot, or disable it and reboot itself and continue with that guarded out. Uh, so the idea is that by the time you get to the end, you're only actually booting with hardware we're pretty sure will work. Uh, of course, if you don't have any memory that works or no processor cores that we can find to work, uh, you're not going to have a good day and you're probably not going to boot. Uh, we also do fun things like doing uh, you know, time of day set up there, a few steps that are uh, not applicable to open power machines. And then we get to the end, we build a preliminary device tree of what's going on, uh, which is the standard device tree that's been used forever. And then we load what we refer to as, as sort of the payload in here, which is indeed Ski Boot and Opal. So Opal is boot and runtime firmware uh, that we'll get into in a second. And also on an open power machine, we tend to start here. We load and start what's called the OCCs. So the OCC is an on-chip controller. Uh, and this is yet another computer inside your computer. 
So you have the computer to start that you boot before you start to boot your actual computer, and inside your computer you have a computer inside the computer to help control the computer. There are many things that are computers inside your computer. And the OCC is an on-chip controller, uh, and it's responsible for hard thermal and hard power limits, as in you didn't throttle down the CPU speed when I told you it's getting hot. I'm going to force you to go slower now so that you don't cause a fire is a good way, uh, <laughs> cause an increase in purchase orders for new processors uh, <laughs> is another way. Uh, so there is a nominal frequency you can run it at, right? There's a, a baseline frequency that you're able to cool, and that's OK. And then you can also you know, ramp it up and ramp it down according to how hot something is. So the on-chip controller is a PowerPC 405 core uh, with a little bit of 512K of, of RAM there. So it runs its own tiny little uh, embedded real-time operating system uh, that fits in that and then can communicate out to uh, the, the host runtime firmware that's running on our, our power machine. And then Linux can get information from that. Uh, and the chief job that you may ever see running at normal time is if you're running a bit hot and you've put lots of cards in the machine, you don't really cool your data center too well, you'll get control saying the OCC has throttled your processor speed so that we don't hit those hard thermal limits. The other interesting thing is you can pull the source code for it for GitHub, and it's about 70,000 lines of C. That's relatively easy to start understanding. Um, I would not necessarily recommend modifying that code and whacking it in your box, especially if it's not your computer. Uh, or it's not your fire extinguisher nearby. Uh, <laughs> but it is. So you can see what's going on there. And you can even look at sort of what algorithms it's using in places or proposing new ones uh, and the like there. Uh, so they, uh, uh, otherwise known as I, I sometimes refer to as the project, uh, having it open can be expensive doorstop enablement uh, for communities. Uh, but it's a really interesting thing to have this open source and out there and be able to see what's going on and then sort of you know, audit that this chip inside your chip isn't doing something nefarious. But we start the OCCs to start doing their job of finding out what's going on and reporting temperatures back and enforcing those limits. And we can run it faster than a couple of gigahertz. We then start Opal. Uh, and at this point, I should point out, we have a couple of fancy things working. We have multiple cores running. So we have all the cores running. We have main memory going. And we have something that is set up so we could transition between power states. At this point, you could think of the computer as looking surprisingly like a computer. It has actually got memory. It's executing instructions. Uh, go. Like, you know, it's just now ready for a normal operating system. And for this, we have uh, a small bit of firmware called Ski Boot. So this is boot and runtime firmware. Uh, it does things like sets up runtime abstractions to talk to the BMC, uh, and then be able to do sort of in-band IPMI. Ben has a. You might want to specify that Ski Boot and Opal are the same thing. Yes, Ski Boot and Opal is the same thing, uh, which is also the next slide because Ski Boot implements what we call the Open Power Abstraction Layer, uh, which is the name of you know, the API. And so technically, you could re-implement Ski Boot, and you still have Opal there. Why you would re-implement it is. Oh, have a weekend hobby. It's fun. Um, but it sets up things like a, a real-time clock. So it finds a real-time clock and lets you get and set the real-time clock. It finds out where you might have a serial console, or whether that's through the BMC, or whether it's directly to UART and has some stuff there. It could be just an in-memory console, especially if you're talking in a very early simulator. Uh, so there's a common API for that. It sets up and initializes PCI, because it turns out that people like to plug PCI cards into computers these days. Uh, and, and then gets a full device tree there. Uh, it loads then the petty boot environment there. Uh, it also will set up uh, at the same time, because we do things in parallel, right? We've got multiple CPU cores, so we may as well do things in parallel. Uh, it will set up any NVLink stuff. It will discover what sensors are in the machine and put them in the device tree so you can find what temperature everything is. Uh, it will set up uh, in-chip accelerators, uh, and then it after it's been reading that petty boot Linux kernel environment there, it will boot it and you get to that Linux kernel and screen to load an operating system. And the, the Opal part of it, which is uh, just a part of Ski Boot, is what we have the runtime firmware. firmware. So this is the firmware that's loaded while you're running Linux. Uh, so Linux doesn't have to care about what exact BMC you have or any of that. The idea is that Opal provides the bare minimum of abstraction to take an existing Linux distro that runs on Power 8 and run it in a completely different Power 8 system, and things will you know, pretty much just work. Right? Small, easy, small abstraction. 
it's more, it's a good idea to think of Ski Boot as uh, a shared library rather than something that's running everything from behind the scenes. The idea is that Linux owns everything and is completely in charge of the machine. Uh, Ski Boot will tell Linux that, by the way, we have a uh, watchdog going on here and you should really call me every couple of seconds. Uh, if Linux doesn't do that, then it's killed, and if it does, then you know the watchdog goes all in okay. But Linux is in charge of anything. We don't try and take anything away, and it's just sitting in the same memory space there, and Opal is the calling convention. So, boot and runtime firmware. Um, Opal is the lovely little interface there, and that you'll see in the Linux kernel source tree is Arch, PowerPC, Platforms, PowerNV, non-virtualized, running on Opal. It is also open source. It's around 70,000 lines of C. Um, feel free to hack on it. Uh, unit tests are great. You can run it inside a simulator. I maintain it, and I'll be nice to you. Um, I will happily sit down with anyone who wants to like contribute code at any time and, and tell them all about it. Uh, so Skiboot will run in the background there. And the other part of component that I've just mentioned that Skiboot will run and run in the background of is Pettyboot. So Pettyboot is uh, the bootloader. Uh, and it gives you a nice little menu, like we saw there, of lets you choose what you want to boot through kexec. So it's just a nice UI on top of kexec. We could just dump you to a root shell and tell you to you know, run all the commands by hand, but a user interface is nice. It also has a great advantage. It turns out we could say programming user space is easy. And therefore, if we wanted to create a menu of choosing what to boot, well, why would we do this all in real mode in a whole bunch of hard constraints there when we could just write a Linux user space program? And we can use fancy things like libc. We could use curses. We could use like curl to netboot things. Uh, we could even use the existing user space programs to read boot preferences out of NVRAM. Uh, if we needed to change settings on the box, we could use all the existing utilities. Uh, if a vendor needed to have a RAID setup utility, they could write a Linux user space thing, and then it would be the same tool. Uh, if we needed to read, to say, an XT2 file system to boot from, guess what? A Linux kernel has that, and the API is just so easy because it's like, you know, open and read, uh, and it's all existing things that are known, and we're not reinventing the wheel and just using existing code that sort of just works. We don't have to invent anything. Turns out that rewriting drivers and networking and file systems is a pain, so we don't do that. So petty boot. Nice UI on top of kexec. Uh, now, kexec doesn't, of course, work for every driver, because not all drivers are bug-free. No, didn't shock anyone. Good. Um, so there's maybe some effort to debug some of these things. And so we just figured, well, it's easy to fix an existing code base there, and people are probably more willing to fix that than it is to perhaps re-implement a giant firmware stack or you know, write everything in force. Uh, for every adapter we've ever seen, uh, or something like that. Because it turns out that Linux works. Works. Well, no, it works. Uh, time to mark is important, and we're not going to reinvent the world. Uh, so Linux is something that has to work anyway. We're selling computers to run Linux on. So we may as well just run Linux there and not port something else or create something else from scratch. Just use something that we have to make work anyway because fundamentally we're lazy, uh, and if we use something that we already have to make work, that means we don't have to make two things work. Uh, it is also pretty much the first thing that runs on a power chip when it gets brought up. Uh, so it's been running for a long time. Uh, and if you're at the kernel miniconf there, you know, Mike and I were talking about running it in really big early simulators of, of interesting things there. Uh, there are, in fact, two proof of concept ports of uh, UEFI uh, to power. Uh, out there that happened about the same time. It was uh, kind of amusing. Uh, but one feature of, of sort of the Linux and Petty Boot and, and Ski Boot approach to having a way to boot something uh, is that it is not open firmware. Uh, for anyone who used open firmware on an old uh, PowerPC machine uh, and has ever written a driver in fourth or ever decided that they couldn't boot off this device because no one has written a driver in fourth for this particular hard disk controller, um, you'll be very grateful for this. So Linux and Petty Boot is nice and easy. So to assemble this, though, right? we talk about now how we run a Linux kernel on Petty Boot, which obviously means we have a root file system sitting in, uh, sitting in ROM somewhere. Uh, how do we assemble this? Because we probably want to you know, compile the Petty Boot program and package it into an init RAMFS and build a Linux kernel and then get the other bits of firmware and then assemble it into something we can actually write uh, uh, to Flash. 
Well, we use BuildRoot. So BuildRoot comes, I think, originally from uh, OpenWRT and is used pretty extensively to build firmware for embedded devices. So it turns out, you know, our machine is kind of like an embedded device for, for our bootloader, so we just use BuildRoot. Uh, we have a BuildRoot overlay, which is the way inside BuildRoot to add extra packages and build options into BuildRoot. I think we now use upstream BuildRoot of 2015.11 version with about two patches or something ridiculous on top of it. Like, it's, it's next to nothing. Uh, and those two patches are just backports of what we've sent upstream already. Uh, so that's really close to upstream there. Uh, and then we just say, well, we want to build this version of a Linux kernel, and we also need to build you know, host boot, and we need to build ski boot in there, and then we need to assemble it into a file. Uh, and we want these user space utilities. So this build infrastructure uh, is also up on GitHub. So you can go clone OP build and start to boot things. At the end of this, you get an image you get to burn to ROM. So if we went and cloned OP build, uh, we can get set up our environment. And we can say here, uh, I just loved how I recorded typos along the way. Uh, we set up a, a default configuration. So this is to build firmware for a Firestone machine. You can configure custom things via a, a curses-based UI. Uh, so we could add packages. Here I enabled uh, using Ccache. Uh, if you know what you're doing, you get to do that. And then you type op build, and then it starts compiling things. So this is starting to compile host boot. Uh, and then through the magic of television, uh, we will wait a while. If you wanted to save something uh, in a configuration permanently, uh, build root is really easy to customize. Like if we wanted to add rsync, we could just edit the config text file, that default text file, and say, yes, I do want rsync. And so you can discover that through the menu UI or grapping through the build root stuff there. So it's really easy to sort of customize for any particular use. And if we get to the end, uh, we will see here, uh, Three hours later on my laptop, uh, we get to the point of where we've compiled a tool chain and we've compiled a kernel and then we've assembled the entire user space that we've built with it. Uh, we then create uh, the, the file that would be ready to write onto Flash. Uh, at the end there, we have 64 meg of Flash. In fact, it's a 32 meg uh, thing because there is a golden side, the idea being that if you screw up flashing, there should be some copy sitting on Flash that will always boot your machine. Uh, so at the end here, we have a file that is uh, directly ready to write onto Flash and boot, uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, we can also run this inside a simulator. Uh, so we can run this with uh, uh, the functional simulator we provide for P8 called Mumbo. Um, or we can run it inside QMU. So if you grab the Ben's PowerNV QMU patches, uh, which are actually used in regression testing of Ski Boot, and at some point will head upstream as well, that's going through that. Uh, you can actually boot this inside QMU. Uh, we have uh, one of the guys in France is just getting uh, the BMC communication stuff going, so you could sort of emulate the BMC communication inside QMU. Uh, and then, of course, you can you know, boot a kernel on that and, and see what happens. Uh, so inside simulators is useful. You can boot that. Uh, or you can boot it on actual machines uh, as well. So other things we have. It turns out that we have uh, runtime diagnostics as well. Uh, and so these are interactions between stuff that you'll see as a user, because you may see a warning saying, this bit of memory is going bad. And that has to go through, of course, hardware detects something. Firmware picks that up. It sends a message to Linux, and Linux goes, oh, look, this memory is going bad. Perhaps I could print a warning. I could start you know, not using that page or any of that kind of thing. Uh, so some things are purely notifications. Some of them are you know, actionable. Uh, some of them are, you know what we have to do now? Panic, because it turns out a CPU cord was just uh, went offline unexpectedly. And it turns out Linux doesn't cope well when CPUs start just magically going away. So it turns out that sometimes you will panic, and that's just you know, what you do. And at least you'll get an error message saying, we panicked because you know, CPU doesn't work anymore. Uh, we also have a user space program called Opal PRD. Uh, so this uh, is a user space program that uh, mem maps in some of firmware and executes that code with a kernel interface. So you know we get around having, if we have any bugs in firmware, odds are we can just seg fault rather than crash the machine. It's also completely visible to you as what's going on. And the bit of firmware code it's calling here is very chip specific things to repair certain problems. Uh, so this is, you don't have to run it at all if you do run it and your distro does install it and enable it by default, you'll probably survive more you know, random machine errors going on. Uh, so this is fairly nice, because you just have it as a nice little user space. It's not something going off and magically doing something behind your back. You're completely in charge of what's going on. That code's also part of Skiboot, and you can grab it from GitHub. 
Uh, some things need to handle in kernel, like we get uh, what we call HMIs, like hypervisor maintenance interrupts. So if it's like, ah, here's a thing, go do that. So there's code inside the kernel to deal with those problems. Uh, for reporting errors as well, we have a facility uh, on some machines to store in uh, you know, non-volatile memory, so in flash or whatever the BMC happens to choose to use, uh, certain errors. Uh, so we can have these things called error logs. Uh, and then we can retrieve these on the next boot and go, well, it turns out that we suddenly powered you off because these reasons. Uh, we also, on some machines, so the big IBM uh, FSP machines are currently the only ones shipping with it. They can also do what's called system dumps, which basically means that you can say, oh, look, we're going to panic and turn you off for a reason, and we'll dump certain regions, regions of memory for you. So as a diagnostic thing, you can get out those bits of memory and out like you know the kernel log of where you panicked and, and go from there, and you get a full kernel log and a full firmware log and a whole bunch of other stuff, and you get to keep all of the pieces or call your appointed service provider. Um, so we have Opal ERD that you can run and get out these error logs and, and see things there and attempt to diagnose stuff as well. Uh, behind all of this, and the reason this is all open source and we're trying to do interesting things with having more people build power boxes, is we have this thing called the Open Power Foundation. And so inside that, we have uh, various work groups, which, so it's much more of a you know, formal foundation work group there where it's trying to get things that are uh, officially adopted by the foundation, but at the same time, everything works in a very open sourcey manner. So you know, we have a mailing list and you send me patches and I go, why thank you for your patch to the firmware, I will now apply that, would you like to test it? So the Open Power Foundation is a thing there as the overarching body. Uh, so the idea is that it's not controlled by one corporation at all. Uh, and one of the big pluses is that you have this entire open source firmware stack. So you can actually audit exactly what the code is running on the chip. Or at least compile it and see if your binaries match. We haven't done like complete uh, bit for bit uh, comparison yet there, but if anyone is interested in having firmware that has like bit for bit build reproducibility, talk to me because I'm so keen. Uh, future things will involve compliance. Uh, we talk about Opal being that API. It would be lovely to have a full compliance test suite, uh, and that is something we're working towards. Uh, currently, we've been more focused on a, a QA point of view there, where we're trying to make sure that what we have is a system that works. Uh, it turns out that having a system that works well enough to ship and support into the future is something that's viewed as a feature. Shipping is a pretty big feature, and so it's nice that we've been able to ship something there and increase QA on that and have that as well. So we're having increasingly a bunch of the tests that started you inside. Here is the special IBM test group increasingly pushing those out to GitHub as well. So there's a repository whose URL I didn't put up where I'm getting the, the people to push out their big tests, which involve, you know, and now we boot this and install this operating system, and then we try and do it with this and this and this and this and this and, and go with it and get to the point where it's like, yes, you can in fact have errors occur on a PCI card and the right thing happens in firmware and kernel and yay. Um, we also have a bunch of stuff that can run inside simulators because you can simulate things and then do a bit better testing because you can boot a lot of simulators. Booting machines takes sometimes more time than actually booting small tests in a simulator, so we do that as well. Uh, everything's available up on uh, GitHub under Open Power there, uh, or you know I can clone it to you on a USB stick if you don't want to waste the time. Uh, pulling from GitHub, but totally do. Uh, hardware, where would you get some hardware that runs this? Well. Uh, as an IBM employee, I'm happy to tell you that IBM sells computers, and I'm sure we can find you a salesperson who's happy to take your order. Uh, you can also go on the website and order machines directly, uh, the, the LC models, like I showed before. Uh, or you can work for Google and use their ones. Uh, they're manufacturing their own, uh, and you can totally uh, go and use theirs. That does involve going to work for Google. Uh, Rackspace is working on a system called Barrelye, and they've been showing this board at, uh, off a bunch. It's a open compute form factor box, uh, and it is a power 8 system, uh, and that's also going to have uh, open BMC, which is what Anton was spruiking last night at the PDNS. Uh, so if you would like open source code also running on your BMC, you should really have a look at the open BMC project, which also wants you know, people to come and have a look and try it to run it on different machines and, and stuff cool there. Uh, Tyan also makes boxes. There's about four other people making boxes whose company names forget, but there's a big openpowerfoundation.org thing that says who's making what and announcements there, and I can, I can barely keep up about who's announced what and I'm working on the firmware for it. Like literally, as we were going to lunch, uh, this group published that they're going to make an ATX motherboard that is a Power 8 chip and that will run all of the firmware I've just talked about. 
Uh, so if you want an ATX form factor open power box with a P8 chip, these guys just literally announced something that could be interesting. So this is the, you can see the snapshot and the time there is roughly after lunch as I put a slide in. Uh, so that should be pretty cool and interesting as well as, you know, large servers as well. Uh, so you can actually get hardware for you know, varying price points that isn't as much as a phone, but is less than, you know, a multi-million dollar computer or anything. So we scale to a couple thousand bucks to way more because uh, it's a high-end server chip, which is nice and fast, and it's, it's good. It's a good machine, open source firmware. Uh, and at that point, I will ask if there's any questions. Ah, we have questions over here. Excellent. I'm just curious, uh, the whole Linux booting into the operating system, like mm. at the boot level, uh, are there any non-open source operating systems still running on these newer power machines, like AIX or something? Uh, you cannot run AIX on open power machines currently, um, and that would be entirely up to their product groups. They are so far over there. Uh, that you know, that's their decision. So AIX still runs on the proprietary hypervisor, and the, which is the proprietary firmware on the IBM FSP boxes, uh, and you can still run Linux on those as well. And that's the LPAR mechanism, Power VM thing. So that's where you run AIX. This is for scale out Linux cloud things. So it's all open source now. That's cool. Yeah. Cool. We have a. You mentioned you have the OSC chip which does the thermal throttling. Mm. So have you tested what actually happens if that one is broken? And are there videos? <laughs> I am sure there's someone inside IBM that has interesting tales of the OCC running. Ben may have a story. No, not just the OCC, not the chip. Yeah, so the OCC isn't a separate chip also. So the OCC is inside the P8 chip itself. Uh, and so there is, a, there is mechanisms in there to make sure that if the software locks up on the OCC, we get notified and the chip gets throttled back to a nominal speed. Uh, so that can happen, right? You know, when they're debugging the code there, it'll throttle back. So there's safeguards there to make sure that it doesn't accidentally happen. Sure, if you go and hack the code enough, you can then make it do interesting things to ignore those safeguards. Uh, but if you talk about talking to a bunch of conservative engineers about are we going to ever accept a patch from anyone ever uh, and ever merge it, is that they are a conservative bunch of not wanting to brick machines or start fires, and they go through huge I, amounts of qualifications for that. I do believe we also have some hardware safeguards. I'm not sure you can actually catch a uh, trigger yeah. fire. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think you can even melt the chip. Uh, mm. I'm, I'm, it well, depends what you're doing, but uh, there are a number of safeguards, uh, not just in terms of software, like running on the OCC, but the hardware bits that are yeah. monitoring uh, stuff and, and, and making sure, worst case, a check stop the chip, which means stop all the clocks, mm. uh, if they think things are going to be really, really bad. Yeah, there's so much, like, um, like just paranoid protective engineering going on inside the chip that you're more likely to just have it go, I'm not continuing and stopping the world and shutting down than ever going to, you know, melt. You know, we say, you know, let the magic smoke escape. In reality, it, you'd have to do something really horrible and be a hardware engineer trying to break it or something ridiculous in an early DG chip because it's more likely to stop itself and stop the world than ever do anything wrong. And that's one of the designs of a power chip is to always stop doing something than potentially do something wrong. Yes, feel free to buy lots and lots of them and see if you can find a way to do it, because somewhere there's a hardware engineer who'd be really interested. <laughs> cool, we have another. Have you, so in your emulation suite, do you emulate like failure of a core, failure of a RAM bank, failure of a? Yeah, so we do a whole bunch of testing involving failures. Um, so there are test teams dedicated to doing this to an excessive amount. And sometimes we go, if you've just received 2,000 errors on a PCI card, yeah, sometimes y your system's broken, fix it. Uh, <laughs> like, like, replace the hardware. Yeah, so we have error injection as well. Yeah, so we can do everything from error injection, so that we'll actually ship you a little user space utility, and you can either uh, look at some of the test suites, uh, starting to have some of that open of what magic registers you go and push to simulate uh, fault injection. Uh, and also some of the commits will say, and this is how you do it with these XCOM utilities to inject a failure, and then you see 
what happens. Uh, you can also do things like simulate, do you still boot when you disable a CPU? So the thing of uh, disabling a core or disabling a bit of memory is stored inside uh, uh, inside the flash in a, penal, in a guard partition, and that's a list of part numbers that are disabled. So when it's booting, it boots that with that disabled, and obviously, you know, Linux will always boot as long as you have, you know, at least one core and at least, you know, some amount of memory. Uh, and so, you know, that ha is checked as well as injecting, you know, failures at runtime and during boot up. And your first stage deals with that too. And the first stage, yeah, so it gets to have a bit of fun things where sometimes it gets halfway through booting and has to reboot, so <laughs> it has these funny things. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At some point, if you're having a certain number of core failures inside a chip, get a new chip. <laughs> yeah, so, so Ben makes the point, it also depends on what, yeah, Ben makes the point of that on some, depending on what type of machine you buy, maybe what kind of availability is there in hardware. Right, so the high-end IBM FSP machines have like dual service processors with redundant links and all kinds of stuff there. And so for the base open power machines there, it's generally will have like one or two cores that could start booting. So if you know, both of those cores go down, then odds are you need to get a new chip. Uh, and otherwise, if one's down, then maybe you will always take a bit longer to boot because you're failing over to the other one. But that will be enough to then boot the machine and see an error log saying this core didn't work and this is why this is going on and it's up to you to, you know, look at the logs uh, and then take action based on that, uh, which we know everyone always looks at the logs, but at least there's a potential to look at the logs rather than just have a, why isn't this working at all? Uh, so you have some levels of redundancy there, and obviously, you know, the more money you pay for a box, the more likely it is to last through more types of failures, and that's, you know, a differentiator between, you know, the different computers. Because not everyone wants a machine to be proof to every kind of failure, and some people really do. So uh, all, all, the, all this code is up on GitHub. Do you actually have uh, procedures, processes internally for accepting patches and, and things and actually um, yeah, putting them into production? Yeah, so do we have uh, procedures to accepting patches externally? Um, we do. It can vary a bit between which firmware part of the firmware project there. So like Hostboot does pull requests on GitHub and then they go through a, a longer internal test cycle that maps into sort of their team and how they've worked for a while. Um, and like part of this is moving a bunch of teams inside IBM from being, you know, do it close and internal to be open source there. So some people are in sort of further along than others as well. So there's a bit of variation, but, and it's a process, but you know, shipping and pushing the code up and accepting pull requests is all a good thing. Uh, so for host boot, it's pull requests. Uh, that's how they're dealing with it and running it through their internal Jenkins thing uh, to test it and a whole bunch of even more expensive larger simulators as well uh, to come out before merging. Uh, for the OCC guys, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever looked at writing a patch to OCC. Um, uh, it's like maybe I think we've had like, you know, one of us even inside the, the lab has looked for it too. And that has like a longer test cycle there. And uh, obviously because, you know, that's something you want to work really well. Uh, for Ski Boot, uh, we have a mailing list that you send patches to and then people will review that and act them and I will merge them very sort of kernel style, act by, tested by, reviewed by, uh, all of that stuff there. There's patchwork as well up on there and we will pull patches quickly or slowly depending on whether I'm at LCA or not. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, that happens and we're pretty good at, at getting things there. When they're merged in, uh, when we cut an OP build release, then various vendors will branch that to make their firmware builds. Uh, so for IBM, so the systems we're shipping, uh, the, like the one I showed in the screenshot there, uh, that's running uh, an OP build 1.7 variant with some patches on top for service packs. So we've just, you know, backported individual fixes there. Uh, for the next major release of that, uh, if you get patch in now, odds are it will ship. Uh, so of course, you know, it's when vendors decide to do firmware builds, but yeah, it will be included there. Uh, if you want it, something in a kernel patch, get the kernel patch upstream. We don't want to maintain out of tree kernel patches uh, at all, um, and we strongly advocate that. So we're like a couple of patches on top of 4.4 now in the development branch. So get the kernel patch upstream if you want it inside that, or get it upstream build root, and we'll automatically get it as well. Uh, so we try and maintain only very little local things. Uh, so in any of the projects we consume, get it upstream there and it'll magically happen. And for our projects there, it varies a little bit, but uh, Ski Boot's really friendly and nice. It should totally contribute to my project. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'll, I'll buy you coffee. <laughs> How easy is it to make a stupid mistake and turn your machine into a brick? I don't know if we've ever physically really bricked one, apart from possibly using all of the wear cycles on the flash. You can, you can probably brick a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to do it. <laughs> Like we, we've never we've never really done that. Like more often or not, than you know, it's it's you've worn out the flash, or uh, you know, this was a past one, the very first board that ever booted. So maybe it's not up to manufacturing release quality yet. Um, and like, I've never I've had to reboot one. I've somehow had to get someone to pull the plug out of the wall and put it back in because of like BMC things. But it's essentially impossible. I say essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Put it so there'll be some engineers that'll be very interested. <laughs> but yeah, do we have time for any more questions, or are we right on time? We're on time. Oh, we could be late. I believe we're on time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much, Stuart.